welcome to our program, Our Community in the Opioid Crisis. I'm Vicki Lowe. I will be the moderator of tonight's event. I'm the director of the Foxborough Council on Aging and Human Services, and I'm also a member of an organization called Safe Foxborough. This is a town uh, group that is led by our town manager, uh, Bill Keegan, and the assistant town manager, um, Mary Beth Bernard. Um, also included uh, for other town departments that are part of that group are the Board of Health, Council on Aging and Human Services, the Veterans Agent, Public Safety, and the School Department. Some of our community partners include the Rotary, some of our area churches, NORCAP, and the Safe Coalition of Franklin. Safe Foxborough's mission is to make our community safer, um, to raise awareness about addiction, and to provide information about substance use prevention um, programs that are out there. We also want to support and provide resources to people in need. Our program wouldn't be possible tonight if it weren't for Mike Weber, the executive director of the Foxborough uh, Cable Access and his great crew. Um, People who know Mike know he's very talented and knowledgeable, and he's the one who's developed the format for our program tonight. It will be interactive if you're watching it in live, um, so it'll be, you'll be able to ask questions of our panelists in real time. You can do that by logging on to Foxborough Cable Access, so it's fcatv.org backslash live, or you can go to Facebook Live, or you can email a question at info at Foxborough, I mean at info at fcatv.org. Um, the message that all of us want to give you is that if you are having an issue with addiction, you are a family member, you're not alone, and we as a community are here to help. So I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, Stephanie Senna is um, a young lady who's in recovery. She is, has courageously agreed to come and uh, tell her story in the hopes that she can be able to help somebody else and give them a message of hope if they're having a similar struggle. So welcome, Stephanie. Um, Mike Kelleher is uh, the Deputy Fire Chief of Operations for the Foxborough Fire Department. He has 20 years with the Foxborough Fire Department, 18 of those as an EMT and a paramedic. Um, Jen Rowe is from the District Attorney's Office. Uh, Jen has a 23-year career with, as a um, District Attorney. She worked as a prosecutor um, in the Suffolk County uh, DA's Office. And then for the last 13 years, she's been at the Norfolk County DA's office. Um, she develops data-driven strategies to target the leading cause of preventable deaths in Norfolk County. Those, those uh, preventable deaths are usually around opioid overdose, impaired driving, and violence in relationships. So we all know Jen, so welcome, Jen. Thank you. Dr. David Falling um, is not a stranger to Foxborough Cable Access. Um, I can remember him being on our show way back when he was telling us about a new facility that was going to be built in Foxborough. And I think we all are very well aware of the state-of-the-art state of facility that we have right in here in Foxborough at Brigham and Women's um, Healthcare Facility right at Patriot Place. Uh, Dr. Falling is a primary care physician with Brigham and Women's. He's also an instructor for Harvard Medical School, and he's the medical director of the primary care practice in Foxborough. Dr. Claire Twark is a Harvard a, a psychiatric resident specializing in addiction. This July, Claire will be starting an addiction psychiatry fellowship at Mass General Hospital, McLean Hospital, and Brigham and Women's. And Claire has been very involved in Stephanie's care, treatment, and recovery. So welcome, Claire. And last but not least is Wenwei Young. Uh, Wenwei is a licensed mental health counselor. 
She's been at Riverside Emergency Services for 15 years, and she's currently serving as the program director. So welcome all, and thank you so much for taking time to come and, uh, and share your stories and tell about your resources. So let's start with Stephanie. Hello. <laughs> Um, how are you guys tonight? <laughs> Good. Um, I always open with, I'm Stephanie and I'm an alcoholic and an addict. Um, I'm just going to dive in and tell about my story, I guess. Um, from a very young age, I guess, um, since I was like a young, a child, um, alcohol and drugs were, I was very curious about them, I guess you could say. Um, Alcohol, it was a common thing. Um, it was around me a lot, you know what I mean? Like just well, family parties, things like that. Um, I was always very curious about it. Um, and, you know, and but when I was a teenager, I didn't really start drinking or drugging until like, um, I got out of high school. Um, every time I did drink or drug though in high school, um, I got caught or um, something crazy happened. So. Um, that's how my drinking started. And um, once I entered into college, I, I basically made a conscious decision to drink and to use um, once I got up there because I knew I was going to be kind of free and I could kind of create who I, whoever I wanted to create, like this different person, I guess. Um, I just didn't want to be who I was um, growing up. So. Um, that's the path that I wanted to take. And the first time that I ever drank in, in college, it was, I, I, it was a blackout. I blacked out. And um, from then on in college, it, that's how it, it continued and as it progressed. Um, but uh, the, the people I hung around with, though, they, um, you know, they were doing the same things that I did. So I never thought that this was a problem. I never, ever had any of those, like, moments of clarity, you could call them, um, where I thought like something was wrong with me or if I was drinking to excess or using to excess. I, I, ne I never thought that. Um, I mean, from an, it's funny. It's just because we all did it. We all drank like that. And uh, I, as I look back, you know, now and just how irresponsible and um, out of control it was. Um, the drinking obviously turned into drugging, um, very quickly. It kind of went along with it, especially in college. Um, and through my four years of college, um, I drank so much that, um, I didn't finish school and I, I that's a direct result of my drinking and my using. Um, I didn't want to do anything but party and, um, it obviously affected me because I spent four year, five years in college and I never graduated. And this is years ago. This is back in like 2004 and it's 2017. And like, it's definitely one of my regrets in my life that um, still bothers me to this day that because I, I allowed myself to, well, I didn't allow myself. I had no control. And, um, it's, it's, it's a regret, basically. But as I left college, um, I came home and I did what naturally an alcoholic does is I got a bartending job. And um, I was always very interested in bartending anyways. And um, for some reason, it was another thing that I wanted to do when I was younger. I just, I know that sounds funny, but bartending was, like, cool to me. And I was just, I thought it was something to get into, and I did. And along with the bartending came more drinking and more drugging. Um, the late nights definitely had something to do with it, but also like the crowd and like that I hung around with and the people that came in. Like I know this, sometimes instead of tips, I got drugs for tips. And um, you know, it just, you know, I, I asked for it. I wanted these things, but it just, it, it progressed and progressed and progressed. Um, it got to the point where there was like, there was a substance in my body every single day. And um, 
Then it came to the point where one day um, I discovered opiates. Um, um, I, it's funny because I remember what I was wearing. I remember the day. I remember the weather. Um, I remember who I was with, where I was, absolutely everything about it. And I remember exactly how I felt. And I thought that I had arrived and this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I wanted to feel exactly like that. Um, so I chased that um, for a long, long time. I chased it and I chased it and I chased it. And um, through the years of the opiate abuse, um, things really started changing for me. I mean, they had, it, it, it took control like early on my alcoholism, you know, and how much I drank because it, it, I didn't even, I didn't finish school. I didn't do the things that I wanted to do, you know, um, that I should have done, I felt like, would, which would be graduating from college. Um, but not only that, but even more now, when I got into the opiates, it started changing me, like the person who, that I was. It started changing my attitude. Um, my emotions were changing. Um, I was a short fuse. Um, I was very angry all the time. I um, very emotional all the time. Um, I, you know, I, I thought like something, I didn't know, like it still didn't click with me. Like I, I didn't understand, like I, I tried to diagnose myself with all these other things. Like, oh, I must be, I must have serious anxiety and oh, I'm probably depressed. You know, I have anger issues and I have this and I have that. And, um, it, but it, it got so bad, it was like where everybody else noticed it. Um, my parents noticed it. Um, People I worked with noticed it. My boss noticed it. Customers noticed it. Um, I had regular customers, people who spent a lot of time there and telling me that they knew something was wrong with me. You know, when I have an alcoholic telling me <laughs> that <laughs> you're an alcoholic or you're an addict, you know, it's, it kind of throws you off guard and it's, it's scary to hear. Um, and I had major jackpots like throughout my drinking and using like jackpots are where like something bad happens to you where you think it would stop you like from drinking and drugging and wake you up like a normal person. We go on norm, normal people like who can drink in safety at um, like if something like that happened to them, they would stop drinking like they did. And I did not. Um, like for instance, um, when I kind, I had a, I, ha I did have a moment of clarity one time. Um, I had gotten out of work and we went to a bar after work because it was open late and I was using in the bathroom and I must have, I, I must have gotten too high or something to where I blacked out and. Um, I woke up on a bathroom floor in a dirty bar about 20 minutes later to people banging on the door and um, it, it kind of, it struck me, like it, it really hit me hard and I remember saying, I was upset with myself. <clears throat> I was very, very upset and I was visibly upset. <clears throat> I. I walked outside and my friends were outside on, on the stoop sitting down like chatting and I came out and I sat down next to them and I looked, I looked at my best friend dead in the eye and I said, I think I'm a drug addict. And everybody kind of like laughed. Um, and, but my friend was like, what do you mean? I'm like, I think I have a problem. She's like, what do you mean? What kind of problem? And I said, with like opiates, with pills. And, um, you know, she sat there quiet with me and, but I never spoke of it again. I just, that didn't, you know, the next morning I woke up and it was all forgotten about. Um, my roommate at the time who I lived with for many years, like she even saw the notice, like the difference in my behavior and like she couldn't even stand to be around me anymore. This is my best friend in the whole world. You know, she couldn't bear the sight of me anymore. Um, 
so she moved out like she she couldn't handle it anymore and um she said she said it nicely that she just wanted to move somewhere else but you know i knew and i just i accepted it and i basically i accepted this is who i am and this is how it's going to be for the rest of my life okay i i accepted my addiction but i didn't say i was an addict nor an, or, nor an alcoholic i said all right this is how it's going to be. It's how it's going to be. So um, I continued to live my life like that. Um, but I put down the opiates and the pills I was getting off the street. And um, I picked up a different, well, it's a, I picked up Suboxone basically, but I didn't get it from a doctor. Um, I was told that they could help me, this and that. And I started taking Suboxone and I ended up staying on it for eight to nine years and I never picked up another opiate. But I was still drinking every single night and using other drugs every single night as well. Um, and I considered myself clean because the opiates were the problem, you know, not the drinking and this and that. Like, it, it, the thinking is what's crazy, you know what I mean? I, the way I thought, like, I put down pills but I said, you know, I started taking Suboxone, but I'm still drinking every night and I'm still doing these other drugs every night. It was insanity, um, absolute insanity. And um, it got to the point where um, I had to move back home now because money was disappearing, obviously. I couldn't pay, I couldn't afford rent anymore. I couldn't afford, my, you know, like I barely had money for my bills now. Like it's just... <laughs> I, I don't know how I survived all those years, like living in an apartment with an addiction like this and like paying all my bills and doing this, doing that. But, um, you know, now I'm at home and, you know, the years pass. I'm still doing the same old thing. My parents um, did find out in the midst of it <clears throat> that um, I had been using, like I had been doing drugs. Um, and they confronted me about it. And when they confronted me about it, um, you know, they were, they, they did really well too, like the way they confronted me, like they didn't like yell or scream, they sat me down, like they had a nice conversation with me and like, and I kind of like let it all out to them. But I didn't tell them everything, you know, I just told them that I had a problem with pills here and there. And now that I'm, I'm on Suboxone, this and that, and I get it off the street, but I want to get it from a doctor, this and that. And that's when I ended up going to Riverside um, in Norwood. And um, I spoke to somebody for a little bit and they were trying to help me find a doctor. Um, because this was on a, this was back in 2011 when the insurance wasn't quite where it was and I made too much money to get mass health so on and so forth like just so I was having a hard time finding a doctor that would prescribe it um, because back then a lot of doctors didn't um, only so many did and um they helped me a lot. Like I, I, I got counseling there and they put me in the right direction of where to go. And unfortunately, <laughs> um, after that happened, I was arrested um, for having pills on me that obviously weren't prescribed. And that was another jackpot that happened. And I was thrown in jail for hours, at, for hours. And um, I, that still wasn't enough to stop what I was doing um yeah it's just it's crazy to think about it because like I it didn't even scare me like I I wasn't I was more scared of the consequences at home with my family being disappointed I wasn't scared about like the law or like what's going to happen to me like you know my record and could this affect my future and like this and that I, I just I didn't care um it just, and then it just progressed. And then finally, um, and I say finally because like it was bound to happen. It finally is when I started using heroin um, and other harder drugs. And um, 
about a month after that, my life quickly spiraled downward very, very quickly. Um, where not only like my attitude and my demeanor was drastically, had drastically changed, not only that, but my physical appearance had changed. Um, I lost weight, my hair was falling out, I had cuts and acne all over my face. Um, I didn't just, I didn't care how I looked. Um, it just, it, it got worse and worse and worse. And, and this is, you know, and I still, I just didn't care. I, this is when I was really in the mess. I just did not care. And um, I was with a friend and she um, wanted to hang out with me for the day. She was acting really strange and she kept telling me, like, she's like, let me drive. And we, <laughs> we were driving on our way to my work and she kept telling me to put my makeup on and I didn't know why. I was like, why do you want me to put my makeup on? She's like, just try to look nice for work. And I showed up to my work in the parking lot and my parents, my brother, um, my three best friends, and my boss were waiting for me in the parking lot, and it was an intervention. Um, so I was like, oh, all right, yeah, because I look like absolute hell. That's why you wanted me to, like, try to look a little better for my family, but I just, I didn't care. And, you know, they approached me, and they said that, um, Stephanie, you're dying. Um, you're gonna die if you keep this up, and I refused to listen. I, I kind of looked at them like they were like, this is crazy. Like, how aren't you guys like this? How embarrassing for you to do this? But it's really like how embarrassing for me because um, the way I looked and and, you know, the only thing that was on my mind, <clears throat> not that I was an alcoholic, not that I was an addict. The only thing that was on my mind is like, yeah, you know, they're like, well, Stephanie, we have a plane for you. Like, we will take you to treatment, you know, like right now. There's a plan in three hours if you say yes to it. And the only thought that was in my mind was like, you know what? I've been on Suboxone for like eight, nine years. I just, I want to get off of it. And you know, like it, it will be like safe, like, you know what I mean? Like I can get off of it in a safe way and I won't be wicked sick. And that was really my only thought why I said yes. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I agreed to it. And next thing I knew, I was in Florida and I was in treatment. <clears throat> While I was in Florida in the treatment center, it was for about 40 something days I was in there. And it was kind of like the whole shebang, the, the thing, I, the rehab center. It was the medical detox, it was like the education. Um, there, there was like outside fellowships that they, taught you about um there, there were groups there was activities like they did a lot for us down there it was also um holistic um therapy and it was pretty awesome like massages acupuncture things like that it was a pretty beautiful treatment center and when i was down there i honestly like started to like listen and like learn that like this was a disease and um you know, and I, and I really did. I listened and I learned a lot. And I, I was like, you know, maybe, maybe I am an addict. Maybe there's something going on with me. Um, and I ended up staying down in Florida. Um, I entered into a halfway house and I did an IOP, which is um, intensive outpatient therapy. And um, lived in the halfway house and you know in the, in the halfway house you have requirements you have to get a home group like like outside fellowships and you have to there's guidelines you have to have uh, have to live by in order to stay in the house and um, I did all those things I listened and I did all those things and you know I but the thing was is I was still the same person just sober just with no drugs, no alcohol. But I always had in my head, I'm like, I, I can, I can drink. I can have a, I can have a glass of wine. I can have a cocktail. I'm in my thirties. I'm an adult. I can do this. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have to be like stone cold sober. It's just the drugs. You know what I mean? Like, it's just the drugs. And I continued to stay sober for about seven months. But, um, 
basically like I was a dry drunk. Like I, I, yes, I was sober, but like I didn't try to change anything about me. You know, I was still the same person. I was still angry. Um, I was still very emotional. I didn't try to get any help, like whether it was like psychiatric or, you know, therapy or anything like that. I just, I was the same girl with the same chip on her shoulder that was mad at everybody, but was really the person I was mad at was myself. And I didn't try to get any help. Um, and so the day I got home from being seven months sober and I moved back from Florida, from Florida to back, back to Massachusetts, <clears throat> the day I got home, I used. Um, and like my poor parents, I just like, you know, they sent me to treatment. Like they did what they knew how to do and they sent me to this beautiful treatment center and I, and I came home and just started using again. But that just shows the disease right there. Like I just, I was, I'm still, I was still, sick you know what I mean I I, um, I don't know and I started to use again and um, and I was drinking and the next thing I know I picked up an, um, a needle and I was using heroin for a straight year and um, this past year of my life um, well <clears throat> 2015 to 2016 um, it was the worst year of my life. Um, things went further down, <laughs> even further down than I than before. I didn't think I could get any lower, but I did get lower. I did things that I never thought I would do. I acted in ways I never thought I would act. Um, I I didn't look right. I, you know, I it was it was horrible. Um, and there was so many times where um, you, th I don't know, like you think a person would stop, but they, I didn't, I couldn't, I could not stop. It, it I, it was insane. Like, I, uh, I can't explain like that feeling. Like, I just nothing. It was never enough. It was just, it was never enough. And um, finally. Um, I <laughs> finally, um, after a month of, I was a mess. <laughs> I was an absolute mess. And um, I had been in a number, number of car accidents in the past year. Um, and it's a direct result of my, from my using. Um, finally, um, I was in my car. I was alone. And um, I was driving down the road. I was like a 40 mile an hour zone. I was going 40 miles an hour and I nodded off at the wheel. And somebody in my, I was alone in my car, but I heard somebody yell my name. Uh, it was probably my angel or something, but I, I shot up and I missed a telephone pole by, you know, like a hair. And um, I pulled over because it scared, the, it scared me. Like I was, I was shaken to the core. Like I was absolutely terrified. And um, all of a sudden, I just, I had like a real sense of relief and like fear left me because I was like always so fearful and about everything and worried about everything all the time. And um, I just all of a sudden didn't feel that anymore. And I picked up the phone, I called my dad and I said, dad, I'm in trouble. Like I need help. And he said, okay, <laughs> you know, and I got help. Um, two days later, I was in NORCAP, actually, and um, once I was in NORCAP, um, I just, I knew that things had to change for me. Um, not just staying sober had to change, um, everything had to change about me. I needed to, I used to say that I wanted this old person back, like the person I used to be, but like, I don't even know who she was anymore. So I wanted to create a new person. Um, and that's what I've been doing. And that's the journey that I've been on for this past year. And I called up um, my therapist and my psychiatrist and they had been seeing me um, 
in within like during in the midst of my addiction about for like a year prior to that but um but yeah because during that point like i'm gonna rewind just a little bit i'm sorry um when i first started seeing a psychiatrist and a therapist when i went to the brigham is because um i was extremely depressed um so depressed where like i said before my hair was falling out um i was 30 pounds less than this and I just, I wasn't eating. I, I just, I was in such low moods. I, I couldn't get out of it. And then they would occur for weeks at a time. So I was fortunate enough to um, start treatment with my psychiatrist, Dr. Tark, and um, my therapist, who was also at the Brigham. And um, once I landed myself in detox, like I called them and I was just so proud of myself that I finally went because they knew how bad I was struggling. Because um, I was constantly missing appointments and when I miss an appointment and I, do, and I don't call, like you know something's wrong. Um, and they knew I was using and relapsing all over the place. Like I just couldn't stop. I was in full active addiction. So I called them from detox and I said, I, I really want to continue my treatment with you guys. and. Um, and they were happy, you know, to, they were happy to. And um, I did, and I stayed in treatment for about 11 weeks because I, I knew I needed it still. Like I knew, I, I knew a lot, like there's so many groups that you can actually take and go to like in treatment, they're very repetitive, but like you do learn a lot. Um, I, for me, it was a safety thing. Like I kept myself so where I was in a safe place where I couldn't leave and you know what I mean? And run out of there. Um, to use because if I write out a detox, if I went home, I would have, you know, I, I can't say what I would have done. So I continued in treatment and um, ever since then, um, I've been working very hard on myself, extremely, extremely hard on myself. Um, um, once I got out of treatment, like I've joined um, certain fellowships and um, I continued my psychiatric treatment and with my therapist and it's going to be one year on June 2nd <laughs> where I get my one year of sobriety and that's within 15 years of using um, this is the craziest thing in the world <laughs> I can't even believe that I'm going to be sober for one year and I've changed everything. I've changed the people who I spend my time with. Um, I can't, I, I changed my career. Um, I stopped driving for a bit because I was afraid to drive because of just, I was a menace behind the wheel. I just, you know, and most importantly, I've changed me and what's in here and I'm trying to like recondition my thinking and, um, and yeah, and now I have a year sober, but it's unfortunate when it comes with the sobriety, you also lose a lot of people. Um, and just to show, I just, I wanted to talk about this because um, something happened to me. Um, I lost somebody about two weeks ago. Um, and it's just to show like how scary this disease is. Um, I lost uh, my boyfriend. Well, he was my ex, but we were together for quite a long time, and um, he died from this disease. And um, it's happening all the time, way too much. Um, it's scary because if this was about a year ago or six months ago, God forbid, I would have been right there with him. And that could have been me. Could have been anybody, you know. Um, but unfortunately, it was him. And... Um, I just, I wish, I mean, some, I, I don't know, more resources, anything. I just wish that there was more out there um, for people. Um, but yeah, um, <clears throat> but because of that, you know, like, because he wanted to see me, he wanted me to see me sober, you know, like, 
he knew that us together was a negative thing and that like we were bad for each other because we used together and everything. So like I dedicate part of my sobriety to him, you know, um, like I wouldn't be here like if it wasn't for him too. And, um, and I am. <laughs> so I choose to chase that, um, till the day I die because I don't, I'd rather live, you know, live a healthy, constructive lifestyle other than the life I was living. But yeah, here I am one year later. So <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your story, Stephanie. Okay, you're welcome. Mike, do you want to tell us what's happening in Foxborough right now? With Absolutely, yeah. At first, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to be here. I'd like to thank Stephanie for agreeing to do this, and I admire your courage. It's, it's an important topic. But, <laughs> so. uh, first of all, I'd like to just point out, we put some uh, definitions together for the people at home that might not be familiar with, with some of the terms we're talking about, so we've kind of defined Suboxone. We'll talk a little bit about what Narcan is, and, or Naloxone, which is a medication used to treat overdoses. Um, We'll talk about fentanyl, which is something that's kind of relatively new mm -hmm. in, the, in the world of uh, illicit drugs um, the last couple of years. Um, I think one thing in Foxborough, I, I don't think people actually think it's here. I think they do now, but the reality is it's been here for quite a while. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's one thing people turned a blind eye to it. They thought there was, you know, that it was somewhere else. It was in a city. It wasn't here in Foxborough, but the... The reality is it, it, it was and it has been, but now it's getting the, uh, the attention, I think, that it needs um, to combat this, this epidemic. Um, the, the average age we see in Foxborough is 34 years old. Um, you know, we've seen people as young as 16, and we've seen, you know, unfortunately, we've seen elderly people. I think uh, Jen's going to talk about you know, the path of, of how you know, this, this opioid epidemic kind of came to fruition with, uh, you know, prescription medication and then, you know, getting pills on the street and then heroin use. I think that's, that's a common thread we see in a lot of people, but, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, we, there's no socioeconomic barriers, there's no demographic, you know, we see poor people, rich people, um, you know, there's, it's, 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 it's across all boundaries. Um, so, you know, sometimes here in Foxborough, we'll see multiple people on a shift if, uh, you know, if, if they're getting a, a, a you know, a higher dose of, you know, it's very, it's not, it's not regulated. Heroin's not regulated. You know, when you're buying something off the street, it's not like the FDA is approving it. So, um, you know, whoever's mixing the stuff up, sometimes it's stronger, sometimes it's weaker. Um, so it's very hard to regulate that. So, um, you know, sometimes we'll see the same person overdose. You know, we've seen the same person overdose three times in 24 hours. You know, well, that's, that's unfortunate. Um, you know, Narcan is effective, but with this, uh, this new fentanyl trend we're seeing, you know, it's exponentially stronger heroin out there, and it takes more Narcan to turn uh, an overdose around. So the, they're, they're using uh, fentanyl to make the, the heroin stronger, and it's, uh, you know, it's a new phenomenon we've been seeing in the last couple of years. I know there's been some uh, news cases recently, one in Ohio the other day, where, you know, this, this stuff called carfentanil, which is used to... Uh, large mammal tranquilizer they use it to tranquilize elephants and, and things um, you know that's out there too that's that's you know exponentially stronger <laughs> than fentanyl mm -hmm. so you're seeing these these new things it's um, you know it's it's gets stronger and stronger all the time um, so unfortunately we had about one death a month for the last six months of 2016 we've had two or three this year already um, so it's it's here and I you know I think you know, getting together like this, the group that we belong to, I think is important as we, as we move forward. So. Did you want to say anything about the, um, the safe disposal of, you know, thank the kiosk? Thank you for reminding me. Yes, <laughs> we do have a building. kiosk in the, uh, in the lobby of the public safety building. Um, it's located at 8 Chestnut Street. It's right in the lobby. Uh, it's off in, in the corner. It's, you know, you can come and you can drop your medications off. It's safe for all medications, I think. Uh, you know, one of the important things that, that will probably come up tonight is, uh, you know, that's a source of, of drugs. People get prescribed things, whether it's, you know, they have a tooth extracted or they have a knee surgery, and these things are hanging around the house, and that's, that's, that can be dangerous. 
you know, can fall into the wrong hands. So I think it's important that people dispose of medications. They don't leave those hanging around. And uh, the, the Foxborough Public Safety Building is a, is a place you can dispose of those medications free of charge. So Jen, do you want to tell us about some of the programs that you're involved with? Yes. Uh, and also, uh, likewise, thank you very much for inviting me to join you here today. I think that um, Foxborough already certainly a community very rich in resources, but the addition of your coalition and the work that you're doing and the, the partnerships that you've built, not only through um, traditional partners in law enforcement and uh, first responders, but in healthcare is really um, going to make a significant difference um, in, in working on some of these issues. And uh, I think Foxborough should be very proud uh, of what you're doing. So thank you for that. Um, I also wanted to say um, thank you to you and to your, uh, you know, Foxborough Police and Fire for the work that you're doing and really rushing to scenes to save lives with naloxone. Uh, the number of successful reversals that we've had in Norfolk County, which is the first county in this nation to have naloxone in every cruiser, engine, and ladder, is, uh, is really staggering. So. The data that I'm going to share with you in a few minutes about what we're seeing in terms of fatal overdoses in Norfolk County is offset by the lives saved, hundreds and hundreds of lives saved, um, thanks to our first responders who were willing to add one more thing to the list of so many that they already do to help us in our community. So when there's a 911 call here in Foxborough, police and fire are rushing to the scene with naloxone ready to reverse that overdose. Um, and I also want to say um, thanks to Stephanie for having the courage to share your story. The data that I'm going to share is, is numerical, but to put it into a context with a beautiful young woman um, raised here in Norfolk County, um, too modest to mention that she uh, was an exceptional athlete, played soccer in college. Um, I think that's important for families to hear. This isn't something that can't happen in your family because you're doing all the right things because that was exactly Stephanie's childhood. Um, and really, um, you know, the work that we're doing is, is to try to um, highlight that much of what we're seeing is happening because of access to pharmaceuticals. I think there's a bigger appetite and interest in talking about addiction when you think about health care. And hopefully some of the information that I'm going to share with you We'll do that in your family and, and in your community and, and make a dent in what we're seeing. Um, so uh, District Attorney Morrissey uh, had the, the foresight to uh, develop a, a review of all fatal overdoses uh, that encompasses the 28 towns that make up Norfolk County. We actually just met yesterday. Um, and I'm, I'm very sorry to share with you that uh, so far from January 1 to April 30 in, in Norfolk County, we had 62 fatal overdoses. Um, so our numbers are going up despite many of the um, data-driven strategies that we've implemented to date in Norfolk County. Um, the data that I'm presenting on the slides really speaks to last year, 2016, when we had 172 fatal overdoses. Um, I've included data back to 2013 because that was the year that I applied for a federal grant um, that uh, awarded funding to um, locations that were particularly hard hit with overdoses. There were two locations on the eastern uh, seashore, the eastern seaboard rather, that, that were funded. One, Manhattan, and the other is Norfolk County. So when you think about the scale of our problem, um, we're, we're smack dab between two healthcare destinations, Boston and Providence, and um, we found ourselves with a significant um, problem with with opiate overdose. Um, the review process is, is uh, really one that pulls together our traditional stakeholders and also our new partners through uh, the Board of Registration Medicine and Pharmacy and Dentistry and Nursing and, and uh, so both from the prescribing and dispensing side and also to take a very close look from a source investigation perspective for illicit drugs. Um, what we've seen is that um, most overdoses in Norfolk County are pharmaceutical and involve medication prescribed to the decedent. Um, we um, take a look at and break down the, the data to, to get a sense of who, what our most vulnerable populations are. And of the 172 deaths um, last year, 
133 were men. So Stephanie's story is a li little unique in that the typical profile of um, someone who we see in a fatal overdose is um, a white male, uh, late 20s, early 30s. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously living in one of the 28 communities, but there are some that are more harder hit than others, some of our more denser urban uh, communities. But Foxborough isn't an exception. Um, none of the communities in Norfolk County are. Um, the youngest decedent last year was 70, uh, 17 years of age. It was the first time we had a high school age student die of overdose, which was devastating. I'm the mother of a 17 year old and a 19 year old, and that, that really took my breath away. Um, to think that we still have kids who are in our school population with all of the resources that we have, with so much ahead of that young man, and we lost him to overdose. Um, I've included that 78 of, our, um, of those overdoses were to individuals under the age of 35. So um, when we look at the uh, medication that's prescribed, particularly opioids, um, to individuals without um, who aren't being treated for cancer or end-of-life pain, it really does take your breath away. And that's something that we've focused on uh, and spent a lot of time on in terms of the strategies that we're implementing. And again, um, virtually all of our communities had a fatal overdose. 26 out of the 28 towns had an overdose last year in Norfolk County. In, in, in the review process, we look at uh, reports from local police. So there's a 911 call. Uh, local police respond, and if that individual dies, it triggers the response of the state police assigned to my office. Um, the, the richest source of information comes to us from our local police reports. In so many instances, um, we um, you know, have police officers who are proudly serving the town that they grew up in. They might have known that beautiful young kid and grown up with their parents <laughs> and, and um, coached that um, you know, individual as a child, and so they take to the time to ask questions about um, how that struggle with addiction began, how there was access to pharmaceuticals, and we've learned a lot from um, our local police departments. And uh, I've listed for you some of the, the things that um, have caught our eye in this, um, in the review of fatal overdoses in terms of risk factors for school-aged children. Um, the, the greatest uh, and most common thread that we see is really prescribing postoperatively to um, teenagers um, following a sports injury during their high school years. And you know that, um, my kids have done a fantastic job with sports injuries. Um, we know from healthcare so frequently that a patient doesn't go back to see their surgeon, but we do know that um, you know, following orthopedic surgery, we um, see physical therapists and a high school athletic trainer. And so we've partnered with those individuals to really um, sort of help identify, along with school nurses and parents, um, who might be at risk in terms of um, struggling with, with addiction following that injury. What happens is you have, you know, an athlete who has a devastating injury, who isn't able to play with their team, and, and uh, while this wasn't the, the case with Stephanie, um, a lot of those feelings of depression that go along with addiction come um, in the deaths that we review because um, they aren't a part of the things that make them feel good about themselves. And so if we, um, as school leaders and those with a medical role in our schools and communities, can help identify kids who are struggling in that scenario, we're a lot better off. Um, we don't see much um, uh, associated in terms of prescribing following oral surgery, but um, I've included it on the list because I think uh, certainly the frequency of oral surgery among teenagers, but also might not be as noteworthy to parents as that devastating sports injury. So we're, we believe that it might be more uh, significant in terms of initial access than, than the reports indicate, but I've included it just because it's a time to be super vigilant as parents um, when, you're, when your kids are, are being prescribed um, uh, Vicodin and Percocet following oral surgery. The other risk factor is lowered tolerance. Um, if you think about Stephanie's story, um, she certainly um, was very fortunate to survive her, um, th her the, the use following the 40-day hospitalization in Florida. So to use the day after returning from rehab is, is what we would call a lowered tolerance scenario. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we look at release from incarceration or release from rehab the day of death or day before, and um, for example, in our overdose death review yesterday, 11 of those individuals died in exactly that manner. Um, lower tolerance because you're confined in a situation where you can't use, and when you're released and you do use, um, you can't handle the amount of drug that your body was, was able to handle before. Mm -hmm. and so that's really what we're focusing on for, for young individuals. Um, we have developed some um, really important work with our school leaders um, following the passage of Chapter 52 of the Acts of 2016, which is Governor Baker's opioid law, um, with ESPERT, which is a screening for um, substance use, but really targeting um, our high school athletic trainers so that when a student athlete is returning to school in sports, to be able to also ask those questions while you're talking about you know, range of motion and management of pain while playing, but, but also questions about managing your medication and, and be able to assist that athlete um, when they're returning to, to sports. Um, also, I think, uh, important for parents of high school age um, students to know is that, you know, the drugs that, that uh, Stephanie used and that we see in our overdose death review are, are so strong that we're seeing a lot of teenage, uh, teenagers who are struggling with addiction um, from a very early age and very close in time to their initial access to that drug. Um, our kids have grown up in a culture of zero tolerance, really. Um, in school, and they have such a high price to pay when they uh, find themselves in violation of chemical health rules and the student handbook and, you know, the, the consequences that are triggered through the MIAA. Um, that a uh, year ago I wrote a rule proposal change to the MIAA chemical health policy, and it passed. And so now um, student athletes in Massachusetts can approach that trusted coach or teacher um, without penalty. And prior to a violation of the chemical health rule, ask for help um, and not miss five hockey games for having the courage to step up and say, you know, while I'd like to think my kids would come to me, they might very well go to their coach or their teacher or someone special to them in school. And our kids need to know that they can do that um, and that they can do that without penalty and remove some of the barriers and penalties that our kids are facing so we can really help them. Um, and I hope that 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 uh, I feel that it's our responsibility to share that with kids and hopefully that will make it easier for those who are struggling silently um, you know, to really take advantage of that and all of the you know, NORCAP and Riverside and the Brigham and Foxborough, what, what incredible resources we have, but if kids are too afraid to ask for help, then um, you know, we, we're not even accessing all that we have. In terms of risk factors for adults, um, lower tolerance is obviously one of them. Um, one thing that we see that, that uh, is staggering to me is the number of individuals who are engaged in medication-assisted treatment who are also prescribed overlapping benzo and opioid prescriptions. Um, so when you, when you review the patient prescription history of that decedent and you see regular monthly intervals of prescribed, uh, prescribed Suboxone, and then you also see opioids and benzos, and recently we've seen a significant uptick in amphetamine prescriptions on top of that, that's um, the typical overdose scenario for pharmaceutical overdose in Norfolk County. And the amount of medication really makes you wonder, how did that beautiful young person live as long as they did um, in receiving some of those prescriptions? Um, prior, prior reversal, prior save from our first responders is also a risk factor. So one thing that we've done in that uh, situation is really to, we've developed a response um, called the Norfolk County CARES Kit, where when our first responders um, arrive at, a, at a, a residential location and they save a life, um, we provide those family members with resources so that when their loved one returns home from the emergency department, that they have information about support for themselves, access to treatment. Um, we provide a sharps container. And all of that information is really intended not for the individual struggling with addiction, but for those who love someone struggling with addiction, information about 
um, a program that the Mass Bar Association started to sort of level the playing field in Section 35 petitions mm -hmm. so that that petitioner, that parent, you know, Stephanie's parents had the wherewithal to, to ride out her recovery despite some of the things that happened along the way. They never gave up. And filing a Section 35 for a parent is, is probably one of the hardest things that you have to do to have court-ordered involuntary hospitalization. And what you know, you see in court is that, um, you know, the, the individual struggling with addiction has court-appointed counsel, but the parent who's trying to figure this out has no representation to assist them. And in Norfolk County, the Mass Bar Association, through the hotline and in the information that uh, is contained in the Norfolk County Cares Kit, will have a lawyer there for anyone who is filing that petition at no cost to assist you through that process. Um, because not being hospitalized isn't necessarily a win, right? The goal is saving a life. And through that um, really forward-thinking um, initiative through the Bar Association, um, I think they're, they're really doing a fantastic job. Another part of the kit is to provide um, the public with um, access to naloxone. So you can walk into your pharmacy and, and you can get naloxone. Um, it doesn't have to be for you. You know, there are some who originally thought, well, it has, if it's going through your insurance, that drug must be for you. That isn't the case. Um, but what we found is that many individuals are afraid to make a request for Narcan or naloxone. You know, you've got 20 busybodies waiting behind you in line at the pharmacy and you don't want to have that conversation. So we've provided a document where you can fill out all of the information hand it to the pharmacist. You don't have to have a conversation out loud. Removing the, the um, difficulty of having a conversation with the pharmacist and saying, this is what I need, and, and really putting it out there. And I know that Foxborough, um, probably within five minutes of getting that document, has the, the widest spread of that information across you know, this incredible community. So Vicki, thank you for, for what you did. It was, you know, I think I, I sent it to you an email, and, and literally within um, five or ten minutes heard from so many different community agencies saying I'll put it in the library and I'll put it here and I'm gonna stock it here so that um, really the the public could could access naloxone r with ease and um, make their household and ones that they love safer. Another um, project that we're doing is uh, safe storage and disposal and we certainly ask um, everyone to, to support us in that effort. There's a lot of medication sitting in homes that, that doesn't need to be there. And so you can go, um, obviously, to um, you know, the lobby of, uh, as you've heard, to the kiosk that's there, no questions asked, drop off medication. Um, you can do that in any police department in Norfolk County and dispose of that medication. And then uh, the police department's then transported up to Covanta. Uh, partner of ours, clean energy business, and they safely destroy that medication um, so that no one else can access it. So um, I think the, the real message um, and what I, what I hope that um, comes along with, with the, the unfortunate numbers that we have is that with the resources that we have, um, particularly here in Foxborough, um, but across Norfolk County, is that there's, there's so much that can come from taking advantage of um, not only calling 911, getting your first responders there, having naloxone in your house if someone's struggling with addiction, getting the medication out and safely storing it while you still need it, accessing the incredible treatment um, options that we have so close to home, and you know the outcome can be such an incredibly positive one. Um, and congratulations on, you know, the hard work that you've done to, to come up to one year of sobriety. So um, we're a substance use county in Norfolk, in Norfolk County. We don't have gang violence. We don't have you know, a lot of homicides. But opiate overdose and impaired driving, both part of Stephanie's story, are what we need to focus on. And I think that um, projects like this and efforts at home can really make a difference in both of those, uh, both of those issues. Thank you, Jen. Dr. Falling, do you want to um, address a little bit how um, an individual or a family might be able to speak with their doctor um, about concerns that they have? 
Yeah, and thank you uh, for inviting me as well. I, I, I have to say I am coming at uh, being a part of this panel, I think, more from the perspective of, of the audience maybe than the experts. I think that we in, in primary care are in the process of learning how to deal with this, this epidemic of disease and, and overdose deaths and um, the, the Brigham, uh, I, who I work for, is you know, in the process of developing policies and procedures. Uh, we, we are the, the focal point where patients come with depression, with alcohol issues, with pain, and we are, you know, we are the folks who often are filling the prescriptions for people with pain and dealing with acute pain and chronic pain and um, w we are we are working on on figuring out how to do this uh, uh, in as safe a way as possible um, I think in terms of depression and I think in terms of alcohol addiction we have long had sort of standard screening for problems and for I think narcotic use, much less so. Um, I think that we are just uh, in the process of, you know, trying to learn and disseminate some of this uh, information that, that, that I, I have heard. Um, I think Stephanie's story is, I mean, it's, it's amazing in terms of the, 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 the moment that you had an opiate in your system and how much control over that it had mm -hmm. instantly is really, very instructive to me in terms mm -hmm. of thinking about patients who are using pain medication and how it reacts. And, 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 I, and I heard something that I, I wasn't actually aware of, and I'll just clarify, if, if uh, you're a family member and you're worried about opioid overdose, you can get naloxone without a prescription, without my involvement, just by right. asking. Yes. Mm -hmm. And th th that's something that, that I did not know. And um, I, I can say that for our patients who are at higher risk of, you know, overdose because of chronic pain, we are just, you know, starting to suggest to them and family members that naloxone is available and um, give them instructions on how to use it. And um, the, the one thing with naloxone is that uh, if naloxone is used and a patient gets better, you still need to call. 911. Glad you brought that up. Um, be, because these medications can be, these you know, these substances can be in your body longer than the naloxone will protect you. So, um, um, in in terms of uh, of talking to a primary care doctor about substance use in general and opioid, I was wondering if Stephanie, were you, were you ever asked that by a doctor? And do you think that when you were when you, before you entered recovery, was there anything that we could have said to you? Or if we asked, my, my you know, one experience I would say with, with substance, you know, with, with screening is you have to ask and you have to be very specific about with your question. Um, and I'm curious if that was ever done or. Well, um, and you know, when my addiction was really full force, I avoided doctors, obviously. Um, but um, in the beginning, when uh, and with my pill use, I, I never, I was always nervous, like thought they were going to find out or knew, like I lied about my drinking, you know, like when I was asked, like, do I drink? And um, I, I would lie about how much I drank. And but I did approach my old primary care physician and told her that I did have a substance abuse problem um, years, years, years ago. And um, she, she knew, but I just, I thought more, this is a long time ago too, I, I felt like more could have been done. I don't know, maybe she could have helped me with resources of where I could have gone, um, whether it was like, you know, addiction specialist or something like that. Um, so unfortunately, um, not a whole lot was done, but um, also I did avoid like primary care physicians for a while, um, just because you know I didn't really want to know what was going on with me. So, I mean, I definitely think some more could have been done, but 
I mean, this was, you know, 10 years ago, so um, more than that, 15 years ago, maybe even, you know, like when I expressed to the doctor, but um, I wish she maybe would have asked, you know, maybe a little, asked me exactly what was going on, because, you know, I had expressed to her that I was on Suboxone, and um, she didn't really say too much about it. <laughs> so, yeah, unfortunately, I mean, it happens, I guess, you know, like. The, uh, the, the other thing that, in your story, that I found very hopeful is that there, there was a number of, there was a number of attempts and failures and attempts again, and the, the fact that you, you failed at one point in time didn't mean that you shouldn't try again. And oh, I think yeah, no. Um, it was, I mean, especially after the first time I tried, you know, to get sober, um, I had more after, like that, after the, like when I relapsed the first time, it happened to me more and more where I was, I had moments where I knew I needed help, where I knew this needed to stop and I could not live like this any longer. Um, it, it, came, there, it was closer, you know, and there were moments like that that were closer together than before. Um, before I just like lived my life, like with my eyes closed, you know what I mean? I just, um, I, like, I told, like I said before, I thought like, this is my life, this is how it's gonna be, you know? But once I did learn a lot more about the disease and everything of addiction and alcoholism, um, and I, like after I had relapsed and like I learned of like the insanity of it and how, you know, I just couldn't stop and it was constantly on my mind that, um, yeah, I, I knew I wanted it more than anything. So I didn't, I didn't stop. <laughs> and you're, I mean, I think from a perspective of families, I, 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 we certainly have had patients in our practice who have had opioid addictions and some who have have died and we've had mm. we've had uh, families who uh, I've known and tried to help you know uh, help their their family members and um, I think that's definitely a, an area where talking to your primary care doctor and helping a family member with addiction requires help and it requires teamwork I mean it, mm. it it's more than than the primary care doctor can do. But in our office, we have a wonderful social worker. We have wonderful addiction psychiatry, you know, uh, resources. So the resources are there, and your primary care doctor can be a, a, an avenue in terms of accessing those resources. Um, I think the, your, your story of the, of the intervention is a, is a great example of that. That takes a lot of planning for families. And, um, yeah, they did a lot of, my parents did, um, sorry to interrupt, they did a lot of research um, about treatment facilities, and I believe they, sp they got some sort of help, um, whether it was through maybe like a website, but it was some sort of, um, for families, with somebody, with somebody suffering from addiction, um, of how to handle the intervention, and um, what to say, and then they had, you know, a place ready for me to go to, and um, had them on the phone, like, ready for me to, like, talk to them once I decided, like, I would go. Um, yeah, it, it was a lot of planning I, for them. I, I, I never really thought about that. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I could imagine, like, it probably... Yeah, that's, they, <laughs> they they did a lot of work for me. <laughs> yeah. And and that and that wasn't the moment of your story that you that you became sober, but no. it, but it was a step. And yeah, it was definitely a step. No, that place definitely helped me. I was not ready at all. Um, I don't, you know, I wasn't ready. I know that sounds crazy, but sometimes people just don't hit low enough or they're, you know, and, but thank God it was before anything happened to me. Um, I just, I wasn't ready and, but it absolutely helped. Um, 
going down to that treatment center in Florida. It just it educated me more and um, understood why I was feeling the way I felt, like mentally, emotionally, you know, physically and all that. And um, I'm grateful for that. I'm very, very grateful for that because um, it, I wouldn't be here now if that, like, if that didn't start my journey in like recovery or like sobriety, like I wouldn't be. So it's a big part of my story. Did you, when you were, when you were abusing prescription opioid pills, did, did you buy those off the street or did you, uh, did you yeah. ever find them in other people's medicine cabinets or? <laughs> a little that, bit of everything. Yeah. Um, well, the first time I was prescribed them, I broke a couple ribs and, um, and the pain was really bad and when I was prescribed the prescription opiate, opiates, um, they worked. I remember how well they worked for the pain because like I played sports in college um, and they worked really well. And then I think because they started to heal, you know, and I remember I took one one day and I was like, oh, like, I, and it, cause I, it, instead of it going to the pain, cause there was no more pain, it just went to my head and I remember the feeling. Um, so it was definitely like whether prescribed, but then mostly it was like from the street and um, I'm sure I've rummaged through people's medicine cabinets. I, you know what I mean? I just, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think in, in geriatric medicine, when uh, we don't know what people are taking, we do what we call the brown bag visit, and we, and we have people take all the medicines they have and put them in a bag and bring them in. And you know, I can tell you that probably most of us are more like the geriatric patient. What goes in the medicine cabinet stays there forever. <laughs> and, um, and we touched upon this, but there, there's a lot of opioids left over from Oh. from procedures and p part of the mm -hmm. part of the law you touched upon is we're really th uh, making an effort to n not over prescribe for procedures mm. acutely uh, opioid medications but uh, i think that the th those medicines are there for kids to find for mm. for the friends of your kids to find and you you should look in your medicine cabinet find them and bring them and dispose of them. As could, could you give for the audience the names of some of the opioid medications that are legally prescribed by doctors? Just so, because people might be thinking, well, I, I probably never got that, but yeah, they probably did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure? I mean, oxycodone is the generic no. ingredient in Percocet. Mm -hmm. um, Vicodin is hydrocodone. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's generic now. Um, th th those are the those are the stronger opioids that are out, but, uh, it, but also there's, there's codeine, Tylenol with codeine, there's cough syrups with codeine that, that have a, a lot of narcotic, there's, there's cough syrups with hydrocodone that are very, very strong. Um, look for those names. And yeah. One thing I wanted to add that, that we see at, at about 40% of our overdose scenes is a drug called gabapentin also um, on the market by the brand name Lyrica, so, and also Neurontin, um, another name for that drug. So that, uh, it's, it's um, not scheduled in a way that really allows doctors to be vigilant about patient access. Um, and it, and the, the last numbered section of Chapter 52 of the Acts of 2016 speaks to gabapentin because of its prevalence at overdose scenes. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a drug that if, if someone you love is struggling with addiction and, and that's being prescribed to them, um, or, you know, that I, I believe um, that it has been presented to physicians as being a safe non-opioid you know opioid alternative to um, diabetic neuropathy and, and um, unfortunately it is used in a way that enhances the high of an opioid and um, further um, you know, depresses respiration, and that combination is what we're seeing in a lot of our fatal overdoses. I also wanted to say 
that a lot of the drug seeking that we see isn't to a, a trusted known physician, your primary care physician. It's in environments where drug seeking is easier, like an emergency department or a minute clinic where you don't have a relationship where, with the physician who knows you and who knows your family and who knows your medical history and you know who's known you since you were a little, little kid. And um, because that wouldn't be the kind of person that would be fooled by something you were saying if, if you were a patient who was who was seeking medication in that way. So our more drug-seeking rich environments um, are in those environments where you don't have someone who's providing your care, who's a regular part of your health care. Mm. Um, and I also wanted to add, too, that one of the greatest challenges that I see is information sharing in this issue. So this is highly sensitive HIPAA-protected information. And what was staggering to me to learn as a prosecutor was that you know we're expecting physicians to change how they um, how they're prescribing, yet there's no mechanism that lets a physician know if their patient has died of overdose. And so how can we truly expect someone to change what they're doing if they don't know that those combinations of medicines um, are, you know, contributing or causing death? And so one thing that I, I neglected to mention but wanted to make sure that I did was that we're holding a safe prescribing and dispensing conference for all who um, prescribe and dispense medication in Norfolk County, really to be transparent with our data so that you don't have to have a patient die and have us refer you to the Board of Registration of Medicine or Pharmacy to learn what we're seeing in those medication combinations and so forth. You can come to the conference. It's in September. Um, information is up on our website. And uh, we, we want to share that information so that those who are making those really important decisions about, um, you know, handing someone a prescription for something like Vicodin or Percocet or Oxycodone can do that, knowing what, what we unfortunately know from looking at fatal overdoses. Can I add something? I mean, from you know, my side of it, like, I, when I walk into a doctor's office, like it's known now, like I, I am not to be prescribed any sort of narcotic or opiate, you know? I made that decision myself years, years, years ago. Um, you know, when I told my primary care physician, I was like, no, like, and now it's everywhere. Like, <laughs> I'm in the, I think of him in the system, you know, um, that as an addict or as an alcoholic, like, I just, I will not be prescribed. But also it's, people are really, um, addicts, alcoholics are really afraid. They're fearful. Sometimes even like with their regular PCPs or like, I was even like afraid to tell um, Dr. Twark or my therapist when I had relapsed, you know what I mean? It's like there's so much shame and guilt going in it. Like they don't always tell their primary care physician um, because there is a, and also because there is a huge like stigma and because we have been treated differently when we say that, you know, when we're on certain prescriptions or when we say that we're an addict or an alcoholic, like it has happened to me before, you know, it has happened to me with Physicians like that. I'm just being honest, you know, it's just it has happened whether it's at the pharmacy whether it's at a nurse somewhere or it's in a hospital like you know like when I've gone to hospitals um, Because of my addiction for whatever reason and the way I'd been treated by a doctor or because I was just the the addict Junkie excuse my language and I have been treated like that before so you know, it's and then that's why, like, you know, that's one of the things that bothers me when it comes to it is just the stigma. And um, like, like you said before, you know, I come from a great family. You know, like I, I have great parents. I was raised right. You know, I just, this happened to me because, you know, I, I truly believe I was born like this. Like I was, I'm an addict. Like a, a switch was flipped in my brain one day and this is what happened. And um, like that the picture of an addict isn't just like somebody on the street like you know what i mean some disgusting bum on the street <clears throat> with a needle sticking out of his arm like it's like your daughter it's your mother it's your brother it's your sister it's your best friend you know what i mean it's things like that so i just you know I, like <sighs> making i just wish like the world <laughs> would see it in a different view is all you know and like the Making it easier to talk to like doctors and nurses and cops, you know, like whatever, like anybody, like 
I don't know. <laughs> That's all. One thing that we've sort of seen a lot and really trying to share the message, and we have two physicians here that I don't know if they've ever had this experience, but you know, our most vulnerable population are those over age 18, and their parents aren't able to get information about their health care. Mm -hmm. But there's <coughs> nothing that prevents a parent from connecting with say campus health if your child is in college, to say, you know, my child has struggled with addiction. You need to know that because my child shouldn't be prescribed, you know, these medications. Mm -hmm. And there would be nothing, you, might, you can't get any information back, but there's nothing that prevents you from contacting those who, who are providing care to your adult children. Um, in many of our overdoses, the kids are living back at home. These are, in, you know, individuals in their 20s and 30s living at home sometimes with their children and yet they, you know, there's nothing that prevents you from sharing that information and making that phone call. So. I agree. We, we would never share personal information but we can listen. To right. That's not share. That's nothing wrong with and that. And help it guide you your own, listen. you know, help you understand something <coughs> that your patient might be struggling self-disclosing. And I, I'm also I'm struck by that there is a lot of time and there's a lot of people who are dealing with addiction who aren't sober and that is part of their health care and we, we need to be able to take care of patients who are actively drinking, actively using. That's part of their medical problems and it should be like any other medical condition. Any other chronic illness, right? right. Mm. Claire, do you want to say, uh, speak a little bit about some of the initiatives you started? I know you've been talking about training physicians. And sure, things. sure. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and it's been a privilege to have the chance to work with Stephanie in her path to recovery. I, um, I think, like Jen mentioned, the statistics aren't quite uh, as powerful as Stephanie's story, but I did uh, take a slide from the mass.gov website showing the really alarming increase in unintentional overdose deaths related to opioids. Especially uh, beginning in 2012, you can see that the, the numbers have really been rising significantly. Uh, this slide only goes up to 2015, um, but unfortunately the problem is really still continuing. So as a, a resident at Brigham and Women's Hospital, I've had the opportunity to work with addiction psychiatrists there and see a lot of the things that we've been trying to do at the hospital to address the opioid crisis. Um, so examples of that include trying to train more physicians in being able to pr prescribe buprenorphine, one of the medications used to treat opioid use disorder. Um, so simply holding more buprenorphine training uh, courses mm -hmm. is an important part of that. In order to prescribe buprenorphine, you need special certification to do so. And so one of the barriers to getting that certification is to get the coursework out of the way. And we've been marching that buprenorphine coursework earlier and earlier in the medical process. So uh, it used to be something, I took it as a third year psychiatry resident, and now they've moved the course <coughs> even earlier so that our medical students are actually taking the course. And so they'll have that oh, wow. part of the work done long before they're even eligible to get that um, prescribing ability. So just getting people on the track to be able to prescribe buprenorphine earlier. Uh, one thing that's been really amazing to see and participate in is uh, doing buprenorphine inductions at Brigham and Women's Hospital right in the hospital. And so what we'll do with the other physicians taking care of patients is we'll ask them to automatically call the addiction psychiatry team anytime a patient has something called endocarditis, which is an infection of the heart valves that can result from injection drug use. And so these are patients who've presented to the hospital because they've had fevers, they're having shortness of breath, they're having symptoms that um, are from this endocarditis, the, the heart, in, heart valve infection. They're not coming to the hospital asking for substance use treatment, and a large proportion of them are actually willing to start buprenorphine in the hospital, and that way we're getting them into treatment before they're even discharged from the hospital. Um, not, not every hospital in the country does that. It's a really unique thing that we've been doing, and it's amazing to see, um, I'd, I'd say probably the, the portion of substance users that a lot of people would think are not interested in treatment, um, you know, people who have really severe infections and sequela of their drug use are still willing um, 
to engage in treatment and, and start treatment even in the hospital. Um, one of the other points that Jen mentioned, uh, you know, as a physician, uh, being mindful of the, you know, the effects of combining different medications when I'm prescribing to someone. So it's been really important to learn how to use the prescription monitoring program, mm. which is a database of pharmacy records that keeps track of a lot of medications that have misuse potential. Uh, not every state participates, but a lot of states are on this universal prescription monitoring program. And so I can search a patient's name, date of birth, and choose all the <coughs> states. Uh, and uh, the default, it'll, it'll go back over a year of time, tell me how many prescribers that patient has had, um, the number of times that person, the patient has paid for a prescription out of pocket rather than with their insurance, um, how many pharmacies they're using. So a lot of um, just quick ways of seeing, uh, you know, are, these, are there some warning signs here? Are there multiple sedating medications that this patient has filled all in the past month? Are there multiple prescribers prescribing opioids and benzodiazepines? Um, and so training physicians how to not just remember to look at the prescription monitoring program, but also interpret the data in the prescription monitoring program. And a lot of the time I'll actually open that when I'm in an appointment with a patient. I think some providers see it as something that is taking a lot of time to do, and um, some of us will actually just incorporate that into our appointment with patients so that we remember to, to check it. And um, that, that's an extremely important step, I have to say. Um, what else? Uh, I think another interesting part and one of the things that I like so much about treating people with substance use disorders is the mentality that you must have when speaking to substance users. So as Stephanie mentioned, there's a lot of stigma and there's a lot of judgment when it comes to substance use, even amongst medical providers, unfortunately. And uh, there's a style of interviewing called motivational interviewing that um, is starting to be taught even in medical schools and in residency programs. It's not unique just to substance use. It's helpful when you're trying to convince someone to lose weight or um, be more adherent to their insulin when they have diabetes. It's a very patient autonomy centered approach. It's a very non-judgmental approach and I've found that it just gives me a, a go-to toolkit when I'm speaking with patients on the spectrum of readiness to change regarding their addiction, from people who really haven't thought of it until I come to talk to them, uh, to people who are ready to engage and start treatment. Um, speaking of treatment, I wanted to speak a little bit about some of the medications that we've been talking about, and if it's possible to go to the next slide. Um, so just for orientation, this slide is organized by what we call the mechanism of action of these medications, so uh, the way that the medication works. So on the left, I listed a few of the opioids that we've been talking about. So um, heroin, which interestingly used to be a prescribed medication and is named heroin because it was felt to be a heroic treatment for morphine addiction. Um, people at first were realizing, oh, you know, if we give people heroin, they stop using morphine. Well, yes, uh, and then, then, uh, uh, then came heroin addiction, unfortunately. Um, so other prescription opioids that are still being prescribed by physicians today, things like morphine, oxycodone, fentanyl. Um, and then methadone actually is a treatment for opioid use disorder. It's in the same category of uh, medications that fully activate the opioid receptor in the brain. Um, so these red uh, diagrams below are a schematic representation of an opioid receptor in the brain. The actual molecular structure is much more complicated than this, so it's just a cartoon <laughs> version for the sake of explaining a point. Um, so all of those uh, medications on the left, they, they bind to the receptor and they activate it fully. We call these full agonists. Um, so you might find yourself wondering, well, if methadone is a treatment for opioid use disorder, how, why does it have the same exact mechanism of action as the other opioids listed there? Um, so methadone is a 
when it's used for opioid use disorder, is a federally regulated medication. So only methadone clinics can dispense it. And they generally dispense it on a daily basis. So patients in treatment at methadone clinics have to go there for the most part every day. Um, sometimes they can earn the ability, you know, if their treatment is going well, to have some take home doses. But for the most part, they go there on a daily basis. So there's a very controlled environment in which this medication is being administered. And methadone has been shown to uh, keep people in treatment compared to people who are not on methadone. Uh, it's been shown to decrease mortality rates, um, decrease risk of relapse. Um, and uh, so you know, some people consider it kind of a harm reduction approach, we might call it, um, but has definitely been shown to still be very beneficial when used in this very structured environment. So in the middle section, that's where buprenorphine belongs. So that's the name of the active medication in Suboxone, which uh, a few of us have mentioned already. So this category of medications is what we call partial agonists, meaning they partially activate the opioid receptor. So they bind to the same uh, receptor as the full agonist, but they only activate it part of the way. And the, the most important part to know about buprenorphine is that the opioid receptors actually prefer buprenorphine compared to the full agonist. So uh, that's very important when we're choosing the timing of starting buprenorphine because, um, well, I, I'll, I won't go into the details of that, but basically when, once someone is on buprenorphine, um, which a lot of people will describe as, uh, who, who are opioid dependent, will describe being on buprenorphine as feeling normal again. So not, uh, not something that brings on euphoric effects like heroin. Um, if someone is being prescribed buprenorphine, taking it as prescribed, and then they try to inject heroin on top of it, because the opioid receptor prefers the buprenorphine, they'll notice that they won't get the same high from the heroin. And that's why it's such an effective treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, on the right is the medications that are what we call opioid antagonists, or they actually block the opioid receptor. So uh, one of them I actually brought with me, and uh, to the point of the standing orders at the pharmacies, I actually picked this up from the CVS right down the street in Foxborough before I came here. Um, so I, you know, I didn't ask a physician to prescribe this to me. I didn't write myself a prescription for it. It's just a standing order that's at the pharmacy. And um, they've actually increased the dose of naloxone because of the stronger opioids like fentanyl that are now being used. So now there's four milligrams in this nasal spray. Um, and it's, you don't have to assemble the older uh, naloxone kit, you had to assemble it. So it's much simpler now. And uh, you simply uh, press the dispenser into one nostril, um, obviously call 911, and um, then there's two per kit. Uh, if the person isn't responding uh, within two or three minutes, then the recommendation is to give the, uh, the other dose. So um, this being, I, I, I was excited to try out this standing order that I've heard about, and um, <laughs> it's true, you can, you can find it right at the CVS here in Foxborough. Um, so naloxone is something that would be used just acutely to try to reverse an overdose. Um, interesting with uh, some of the stronger opioids like carfentanil that you mentioned and uh, fentanyl overdoses. In hospitals, sometimes not only will mm -hmm. the Narcan, uh, the naloxone nasal spray need to be administered, but patients will actually have to receive naloxone infusions. So just drips of uh, naloxone infused into their body because the opioids are so strong. Um, another thing to be mindful of with fentanyl and uh, fentanyl particularly is that uh, when it's being illegally manufactured in places like Mexico and China, it's now being put into tablets that look like the usual opi prescription opioid medications and even prescription benzodiazepines. So mm -hmm. people who are buying tablets off of the street thinking that they're buying a prescription opioid that's you know, what they're used to might actually be entirely fentanyl and not have mm -hmm. any of what they're used to at all and be much, much more potent and bring a higher risk of overdose. Right. Um, the other medication that I wanted to talk about is naltrexone. So it sounds very similar to naloxone, but it's naltrexone. The brand names of that are Revia and Vivitrol. 
and this is actually used as a treatment for opioid use disorder. The naltrexone in the pill form is taken on a daily basis. The long-acting injectable form of naltrexone is given usually once every four weeks. And that is basically putting a cap on top of that opioid receptor. It doesn't activate it at all, and it prevents other opioids from being able to bind. Um, so that's another option. Um, we at the Brigham and Women's Faulkner Hospital Addiction Recovery Program, we have both buprenorphine and naltrexone programs that are excellent. I highly recommend them. I've uh, had the privilege of being able to work there um, once a week for the past year now, and it's amazing. Uh, all the groups that are available and the providers who are there are fantastic. Uh, I've learned a lot from them. And, um, you know, I, I hope it, so we've kind of talked about our, our messages that we each want to pass along. I think addiction psychiatry is the most fantastic area to go into. There's um, it's just so much satisfaction in helping people like Stephanie and uh, anyone else uh, out there who's interested in going into medicine, or interested in going into psychiatry. It's, a, it's an excellent choice. So, yeah. Thank you. And now, uh, Wenwei, do you want to, um, Wenwei from Riverside Emergency Services, the place you'd call if, if you're trying to help someone, do you want to talk a little bit about your, your programs? Yes, um, thank you for inviting me um, and really you know, appreciate the opportunity to hear you know, Stephanie's story because um, I think that is very powerful you know, when you know, uh, someone is sharing you know, a personal story you know, and how they have you know, been through that process you know, and eventually becoming, you know, I mean, recovery is your journey, you know, uh, <laughs> there's still way to go, you know, but, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, your story will help others, you know, to have that courage to move forward, you know, and, and you know, get help, you know, uh, when the timing is right, you know, uh, you have mentioned a lot of important things, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm coming from Riverside Emergency Services, we're 24-7, you know, um, um, we provide 24-7, you know, service, you know, we always have, you know, uh, trained clinicians in responding to the phones, you know, to provide resources for individual. You know, if you know you are not ready, you know, but you just want to kind of learn what's available out there, you know, I think that Stephanie had mentioned, you wish that you had known more resources back, you know, or there's more resource available. You know, I think that part of us can act, you know, as that resource, you know, to you know, uh, share, you know, uh, what's available out there, you know, so mm -hmm. when opportunity comes, you know, you know where to start, you know. Um, we also provide, you know, face-to-face uh, -face assessments, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, um, helping out understanding, you know, what, you know, the person's story, you know, in then recommending what might be the necessary next step or if they're you know, not ready for this, what other options might be available, you know, right there. Or, you know, in need of time, you know, you really need placements. So we also have that, you know, knowledge and capability to kind of, you know, work with the insurance company, you know, in a sense to, you know, figure it out what's covered and what's not covered mm -hmm. and where to go from there. Um, and besides, you know, Riverside have other programs available, you know, such as what you have mentioned about the outpatient, you know, uh, program in mm -hmm. Norwood, you know, yeah. that's a more specialized in, you know, counseling as well as, you know, psychiatric, you know, medication prescriptions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we certainly, you know, not only provide, you know, uh, treatments for substance abuse, but also for, you know, people struggle with mental health, you know, uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and. You know, um, I just want to piggyback, you know, to, you know, a lot of things that you guys have, you know, shared, you know, tonight, you know, um, when someone, you know, um, really struggle with getting help is part of that reason, the stigma, mm -hmm. you know, because of stigma, you know, people feel, you know, or in fact have, you know, um, many cases proven that, you know, it's being, it could potentially be mistreated, you know, because knowing you have this condition, doesn't matter if it's addiction or mental health. You know, people will have different reactions to it. You know, um, unfortunately, you know, among the you know providers as well. You know, um, not along with the social environment. You know, if a lot of people who are resistant to get treatment, it's because I don't want the neighbor to know. You know, what our family is going through. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to disappoint my parents because then, you know, I mean, I feel like very, you know. Um, 
proud of your you know, parents for you know, being so supportive in the sense that supportive. when they treat you, they are not judgmental. You know, those are the things that we really, you know, the key things to help people in recovery mm -hmm. is you know, using the non-judgmental approach you know, um, because addiction is not a choice. Addiction is a disease. Mm -hmm. you know, um, yes. When you are dependent on substance, you know, to get through your day, you know, um, it's not like you choose literally to do it. It's that had taken your kind of judgment away, and you know, and every day, you know, seeking the next dose might be what you are kind of focused on. You know, not necessarily thinking about you know anything else. Um, and I think that you know. The stigma also have proven that a lot of times the numbers of people who get treatment is still minimal. You know, there are still a lot of people who are not seeking treatments. You know, um, and I think that the stat you know, statistics, you know, talking about you know the, you know, um, the, um, the potential overdose cases are still minimal because like there are a lot of cases. I think that Mike had mentioned people who receive not. Uh, Narcan treatment, not necessarily agreeing to ride with the ambulance to go to the emergency room. So there's a, also that data not collected, you know. Um, and I think that it's really important, you know, for people to know that following even the Narcan treatment, you know, um, you know, going to the emergency room is a, is a methods of more medical observations. You know, the, it's you know, and post you know the observation. You know, when it's deemed medically clear, you know, um, you know, uh, the actually, you know, the chapter 52 also support that all the emergency room need to, pull, you know, offer the individual who just received Narcan treatment as well as, or, you know, physician actually suspect someone had overdosed on any, you know, uh, on substance in, in, in uh, opiates uh, overdose, even without Narcan treatment, they're supposed to offer you know, opportunity for a substance use disorder assessment. You know, because by offering that, it gives opportunity for the individual to know that there are treatment out there, there are mm -hmm. resources out there, you know. And in fact, if, you know, the, you know, you want the help at that time, you know, we can also try, you know, uh, because, um, you know, we have worked with Norwood Hospital in, you know, conducting the substance abuse, treat, you know, um, assessment. You know, uh, we um, actually w can connect people, you know, based on the resource we know of to, you know, detox treatment or to other, you know, uh, it potentially, you know, we know that people doesn't really need that medical detoxification. You know, they are, you know, treatment like you have mentioned, the IOP, mm -hmm. you know, even the partial, you know, hospitalization programs, you know, um, or, you know, um, certain times insurance also cover for CSP, which, you know, uh, means is community, you know, uh, support program, you know, uh, provide many, you know, kind of case management to make sure people does follow through with treatment. So there are, in fact, a lot of resources out there. And I think that the past few years, even the state had working really hard to, you know, you know, provide a lot more assistance. And I think that that's the difference you might feel, you know, from years ago. Oh, absolutely, you know, yeah. You know, that they're actually, you know, for youth, they are like, you know, the intake, you know, um, service for youth, you know, we know the number, I guess I didn't include, you know, in the, you know, slide, you know, um, it's part of, you know, uh, this is what you should learn that youth actually have a separate intake line that you can call, you know, um, and they can then talk to you about, you know, uh, different treatment options, you know, they are, you know, detox treatments, you know, they are residentials, you know, there are young adult residential options. There are even recovery <laughs> high schools, you know, options, I've you know, heard which, about those. yeah, you know, they, you know, they will work with store district, you know, to, you know, figure out if that potentially is helpful right. options, you know, um, and there is also outpatient, there is medical assistant, assisted treatment, you know, mm -hmm. um, so through that, you know, central intake hotline, you know, uh, it's 800, sorry, it's 866-705, to 807, and they are able to connect people to the specific youth treatment. And I think that's important to mention that, you know, uh, for youth, there is actually someone who are trained and able to you know, walk the parent through the process and mm -hmm. how to get access to those options. Um, 
And as two adults, you know, the uh, Bureau of Substance Abuse uh, Services actually also provide mm -hmm. a hotline for people to call to get, you know, um, help, you know, um, the number I think we have it in the we slides, right? We can show the resources okay. and we will have them available at the end as okay. well. You don't have to read the number out. Okay. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come up on the screen. Thank you. Um, and then I think that I also want to mention that, you know, through this process, I think that family, you know, parents are usually the one that sees everything, but not knowing where to go, you know, and I think that the local service a program called Learn to Cope um, actually provides support for parents, you know, uh, or family members who have individuals they care about struggling, you know, with that, with the, with the issue, you know. Um, um, there's also one resource I wanna mention is called Massachusetts Organization for Addiction um, Recovery. It's very, it's focusing on peer run, like it's peer support. It's for, you know, individuals who are in recovery to support someone who is struggling. You know, I think that, you know, um, Riverside, you know, really focus a lot on the, you know, the peers, you know, we have, we actually have certified peer specialists who are the individual who kind of go through the process themselves and is in recovery and able to use their personal experience to kind of help people and support people. Wow. You know, I think that's very powerful, yes. you know, um, that's why I really, you know, um, thank you for, you know, uh, bringing your story forward because I think that a lot of times provider can tell people about this is what you do, you know, what you, you know, need to, you know, but that not necessarily is the most helpful mm -hmm. thing. But for people who know like, oh, I'm not alone. You've gone through this process as well. Yep. You know, maybe I can pick up, you know, maybe not that moment you're ready. You know, the next time when they're ready, they know last time I have heard the story, this is where I wanna go to get help. And the other thing that I know that is very important for you is I'm very glad that that first experience of you getting treatment is very positive. Mm. You know, I think that we also need to be mindful that when someone comes to us and at, you know, tell us about their issues, you know, um, that's their first time really speaking up. And if we use a judgmental tone or you know, um, a way to interact, that's going to stop them from wanting to seek out help again. You know, um, so you know, um, and I'm very glad that your first experience was positive because then when you're ready for, for help, you pick up the phone and ask your you know, family mm -hmm. and say, I need help right now, take mm -hmm. me, you know, do it. And you are not hesitant about it, you know. Um, right. So. Well, that's another reason why I went straight to NORCAP. Um, I just, they're a great facility. I just, and they're really helpful there. Um, a lot of the staff themselves are in recovery and mm -hmm. just, they know what they're doing. It's a great place, so. Um, I do have a, a couple of pieces of paper that have been handed to me with comments. Um, one of them, this is so timely because we were, we've all been talking about how a lot of times people feel like Foxborough is, you know, that this isn't a problem in Foxborough. And I actually have something from the Foxborough Police, a press release from today. And it says, Officers Head, Para, Burns, and Sergeant Chamberlain responded to a call for service early Saturday evening for suspicious activity. The subsequent investigation resulted in the arrest of two Bellingham men, Mark Patton, 28, and Christopher Landy, 31, who were charged with the possession of over 50 grams of suspected fentanyl. This is believed to be the largest seizure of fentanyl in the history of the Foxborough Police Department. Fentanyl is an extremely potent opioid which has been linked to a large number of fatal overdose deaths in the area communities. The two suspects were arraigned Monday morning and pled not guilty at Rentham District Court on a variety of charges, including drug trafficking, and the police investigation is continuing. Pending charges represent accusations. All defendants are presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt under the United States. Um, Constitution, and here are some pictures from the Foxborough Police Department that they sent in to us via our, <laughs> our live streaming. So that's pretty amazing 
that this is all happening at the same time. So I think we can all agree that this is very real crisis that's here in our community. Also, we did have a comment uh, via Facebook for Stephanie. It says, congrats on getting clean and keep up the awesome job. And I think we all agree with that. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Stephanie. Um, you know, when Steffi and I were talking about setting up this, um, this program, um, one of the things that she said was important to, for her to convey is that there's hope and that people can and do recover. And I hope that that's something that people in the audience have gotten from this program. Um, we are here to help. Our list of resources are available on Foxborough Cable Access um, website. Um, they'll also be on the town website. We have a PowerPoint of the slides that have been shown here that I will have on um, the Foxborough Council on Aging and Human Services section of the town website. And um, I also just wanted to thank all of you for being here and, and spending all this time. But I also wanted to give a special thanks to Cindy Peterson of Brigham and Women's, who was really instrumental in helping get our panelists together. So thank you all so much, and to Mike and the crew. And um, I think it's been a, a great program. Oh, and the other thing I just wanted to mention is that form that you can use to go, like, if, if you weren't clear and didn't want to, you know, you wanted to hand this written out to the pharmacist because you were embarrassed or wanted to, you know, protect your privacy, um, this is, these forms are available at the Foxborough Senior Center, they're at Town Hall, they're at the Boyden Library, um, there are some churches that have announced this on Sunday and they have the forms available in their lobby. Um, there are some at Brigham and Women's on the table in the front lobby. And um, with it, there's also an instruction sheet that tells you um, how to avoid an overdose and then what to do when someone has overdosed as far as calling 911, making sure the airway is clear, yeah, and I think, I think all of the other instructions. I think one thing we really want to recommend uh, strongly is that if people do take Narcan uh, and have it in their home, that they do have CPR training. Yes. I think they really go hand in hand. Um, yeah. So I think that's something we need to stress more too. It's that the, the Narcan is not a magic bullet. It takes time, and, and uh, you know, really, it's a medical emergency, and those people need to be managed medically. Right. So when someone does get Narcan, they do, you know, a lot of times they're in respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest. So, mm -hmm. and Narcan is not effective if you're in cardiac arrest. You know, and really, I think you did, CPR is a treatment. You did mention when we were, you know, had a, another meeting that. Um, sometimes people think it's like they use Narcan and it's instantaneous, and right. it does take a few. It's like minutes in the movies, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's multiple ways to give Narcan, and, and the you know the most um, easy way is the, the nasal, and it's going to be absorbed into the system. If your system's depressed because of you know overdose, it's going to take a long time for it. When the paramedics get there, they give it IV, and mm. it's, it's instant. It's like the movies; people wake up within seconds. But the the nasal Narcan that's prescribed by the pharmacies and given by civilians is not. It's not as fast long. acting, and mm -hmm. you know things like fentanyl. You know, as, as um, we mentioned, it, people you know need to be managed for days sometimes medically. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know critical is, is you know CPR training for these people, and um, you know calling 911. Don't try to manage these people on your own. You know right. at home, and we're, we we fall under the same HIPAA rules and everything. You know we're medical providers downstream, so we. You know, there's, there's privacy and everything that we do as well. We're bound by all the same laws as, as the uh, physicians. Okay. Well, thank you very much for being here. And as I said, our resources will be available. The show will be repeating on um, Foxborough Cable Access. If you want to go to Foxborough, oh, fcatv.org um, backslash opioid, you'll be able to see our program again if you missed anything. So thank you very much for joining us and thank all of you. <laughs> Especially you.